Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Ben Nearing and I'm here to give you an introduction into photography. I am giving this as a lecture in person and recording this for the internet so that you can view it anytime you like. And hopefully those of you who are not at the lecture enjoy it and get something out of it too. So a little bit about me ahead of time is that I have been doing photography for about 25 years. I've been doing my version or my business currently of Ben's Viewfinder for about the last 15 years. And I love to take pictures. I love to share my pictures. I love to teach people about photography. And hopefully that comes through in the images you see today. And hopefully you get some cool information. So why don't we dive right in? So the first part of this presentation is going to be about kind of different types of photography and maybe trying to find what type of photography would draw your interest or maybe kind of where you would want to start to get into the art form. The first type of photography we're going to talk about is my personal favorite type of photography and that's landscape photography. Now the definitions I'm going to give you for these things are just kind of my definitions. They're not the, the Webster's Dictionary. They're just I what I consider them to be. And the other thing I'll tell you about these types of photography is that there are a lot of subsets inside of these types of photography where landscape photography can be broken down into just sunsets, people who just photograph sunsets, or portrait photography could be broken down into just photographing babies. So there's subsets inside of these that we won't really focus on. I'm just going to give you a general overview. So again, my primary and favorite thing to do is photograph landscapes. And I consider those to be pretty much photographing anything in our natural world that happens and occurs naturally in the world. That can be outside like this, Horseshoe Bend. This is the Colorado River. It could be inside of a cave system like this. And of course, our beautiful, gorgeous Grand Teton Mountains. All right, next we're going to talk about city photography. And again, I'm not going to go into depth about what exactly these are. They're Kind of pretty self-explanatory. I'm showing you some different examples of them. This is city photography. This is, I focus a lot more on trying to get kind of interesting perspectives when I do city photography. And although this isn't one of my most favorite types of photography, I'm a what you call an opportunistic photographer. I always tend to have a camera with me. And when I travel and go to different places in different cities, I always want to use my camera. So that was New York City you just saw. This is Seattle. And I really want to get a perspective with Mount Rainier in the background. So this is, and of course, you got to have the Space Needle in there, right? So, and here's a perspective of just these skyscrapers in Chicago. I like the mirrored sun, the kind of textured sky. So, and just kind of a different angle than you might see from normal city photography. Next, we're going to talk about probably my second favorite type of photography, which is wildlife photography. And to me, this is really about capturing moments capturing these like beautiful creatures and capturing like something that makes them unique and beautiful and I don't know I just I love animals I love wildlife I love being out in nature and moments like this with a mother and child elephant at a watering hole in Kenya this is a bighorn sheep or a ram that I encountered in Badlands National Park and I obviously love the sun. The sun is just getting ready to set in this photograph, so I get that nice warm glow on the ram's head. And this is a jaguar in a zoo in Memphis, and it was an extremely hot day that day. So he or she is hiding back in the shadows of their cage and uh, really just trying to just kind of peek out and see what's going on in the world and what the zoo goers are doing. And I just kind of really liked it. And I like the darkness of the background of this, and it's really focused and I love the eyes. Next we're going to talk about macro photography. Now this is kind of a specialized version of photography and I really enjoy doing this but this is one of those types of photography that are conditional. You got to kind of go and hunt for it and you'll notice in this photo specifically if you kind of go into like the eyes a lot and kind of look in there you get some really cool kind of details that if you were just to take a normal picture of a wasp that you wouldn't necessarily get. And the art of macro photography is getting very close to things and kind of really pulling out those details. So this is a wasp. Here's some water droplets on a plant. And again, you get the little details, the little tiny, even though it's a water droplet, you can see the little aerated bubbles in the water droplet. 
And next, this is just an orb weaver um, hanging out on its little uh, web. And this I took while on a hike in Kauai. I just really kind of like the light. And I really like the web and just kind of the angle of it. Next, we're talking about subject photography. And to me, this is kind of um, a broad way of explaining this. But I look at subject photography as being the art of taking a picture of something you want to define like as the photograph. And so to me, in this case, this is the moon. And in this case, it's the Peter Iredale wreck in Oregon on the coast. Now, in this case, there's obviously a scene around it, but you can tell very obviously that the subject of this photograph is what's important. And here's the sun and moon combined uh, to create the total solar eclipse. And the next thing we're talking about is portrait photography, and this is probably the widest and most accessible form of photography that you can do, because um, you can do a lot of different types of portrait photography, anything from family photography to children to sports to every day just walking around the street. And so this is an example of a modeling photograph I did for a beautiful woman named Rachel. And here's an example of a beggar I found on the streets of Rome. She was very sweet, and I exchanged some money for just a quick snapshot of her. And then, like I said, an example of sports photography here, but again, these are still portraits. It's still people. And so I guess that brings us to the point that that isn't all the types of photography, but that is kind of just to kind of get you started. And like I said, there's a lot of subsets in there. So while looking through those photos, you know, something kind of reached out and grabbed you and made you think, you know, boy, that would be something I'd really be interested in. I'd love to take pictures of animals, like this beautiful orangutan. Or you go, man, I love cities. I love urban environments. I love ge geometry. I love architecture. You know, you can do that too. And the reality is, is that you don't always have to just pick one thing to do. Obviously, as you're looking through the photos I'm showing you, I'm showing you all different types of photographs. Yes, I am primarily a landscape, nature, wildlife photographer, though it's probably where most people would probably group me into that. Uh, but I like to travel. I like to go to cities and take photos. I'll take pictures of people on rare occasions. So uh, really into astrophotography. So you're not always roped into just one thing. Feel free to have as many as you want. These next slides are going to be a little bit wordy. Um, some are going to be just kind of talking mostly about what you need to get started, and that is obviously a camera. Now, there is going to be occasions where I'm going to tell you basically that you need to start small. Just get a camera, any camera, whether it's a phone. Ideally, I would recommend that you start with a camera that has more advanced functions so you can grow into it and really achieve the photographs that you want to take. And to be able to achieve some of these photographs, you have to have certain control over cameras. And then as advanced as phones have gotten, some of them will not give you that kind of control you need to get some of these types of photographs. So there is also the fact that some of the types of photographs, like the macros I showed you, require specialty type lenses to take. They have to be rated to be able to get up that close and get those details for you. Or if you're taking pictures of a dangerous animal, like a bear or something, you need to be pretty far away. So you have to have a special camera lens that can kind of shoot that far. So sometimes you need special stuff. For things like long exposures, like shooting stuff like the moon or, or stars or things like that, you sometimes need things like tripods to help stabilize your camera because you can't hold them still enough with just your hands. And so that's a basic start there. And then usually the, the next thing that people really want to know from me is, well, what kind of camera should I go with? And they always want to ask me what type of camera I use. And what I say is that you can go with any camera brand. The three biggest camera brands I mentioned here are Nikon, Canon, and Sony. I personally shoot with a Nikon, but honestly, doesn't matter. A good Canon camera is going to take just as good of a picture as a good Nikon camera. You're not going to go wrong. The reason that you tend to find people in camps in these situations of only shooting Nikon or only shooting Canon is that the lenses and all the accessories you buy and everything like that aren't necessarily cross-compatible with the other brands. So if one year you shot Nikon and the next year you decide you want to go to Sony, you have to reacquire all the gear that you built up. After 25 years of doing this, that would be a lot for me to replace, to switch from Nikon. 
All right, and then I mentioned here that one of the great ways to kind of get started into this, if you don't have much money or you just kind of want to um, go as simple as possible to get into the market and see if you enjoy doing this, is to go to thrift stores, secondhand, online, used. There's a million places, and cameras have been around a long time, including digital cameras. Digital photography has been around a long time too. So you can go back a few years and find some of this introductory gear that still gives you control over the main settings on a camera to really get started and take some really kind of awesome photographs at not a horrible price. And to be honest with you, with this being such a popular form of art, you get people going in and out of it a lot. So people will buy a bunch of gear, try it out, kind of lose their luster for it and want to turn around and sell it. So finding a good price for a decent camera isn't usually too hard to do. So um, I do mention on this slide also that um, there's some specialty type of cameras out there like Hasselblad. They offer something called medium format photography. It's not something you should bother with for now or worry about too much for now. Uh, but it is out there and there, there's some kind of specialty stuff you can really dig into. The other thing I mentioned here is film cameras and I still own film cameras. I started on film cameras and film is a lot of fun and can do some kind of really unique things, but they're not as prevalent nowadays. Unfortunately, it is kind of a dying art. It is harder to find film for special cameras. It is harder to find people to develop that film and turn it into photographs for you. And unless you kind of have a dark room in your home or near you that you can use to develop your film, it kind of becomes a really tough uphill battle. But doesn't mean you can't do it. And film cameras are readily available also. All right. So now that we've talked about cameras a little bit, you're kind of thinking, wow. And especially if you're here in the lecture and you see all this gear sitting in front of us, you're thinking, well, man, it's going to take a, a gazillion dollars to be able to go shoot a beautiful photograph. And then having nice cameras help and having the specialty gear you need to to shoot certain types of photography really help. But you can definitely take photographs with really expensive gear, but you can also take really great photographs with not so expensive gear. So this example here of Yosemite National Park in uh, California was taken with about $14,000 worth of camera gear. That's the camera body, the camera lens, the tripod it was shot on. Um, and does not include any of the travel costs or anything like that to go here. That's just the physical camera gear itself to take this photograph. But next, I'm going to show you this photograph, which is one of my favorite photographs. I absolutely love this photograph that I took in Savannah, Georgia. And I took this with $700 worth of camera gear. Basically a $500 camera, $100 tripod, and uh, I used a remote firing system in this case to be able to uh, hold the camera still while I took a longer photograph to capture the lightning. So you don't always need a $14,000 camera to take an awesome photograph. And I gladly print this and hang this on my wall. Next, if you're here in person, I'm going to kind of show you some of the lenses and cameras I brought. If you're not here in person, you don't get to experience this. You should go online, do some just research and look up different types of camera lenses, kind of see what there's offered. You're going to find that they cost a lot of different amounts of money. There's differences in them about how far away that they work to take camera or photographs. There's different quality glasses and how clear the picture is that you're going to be able to take. So you're going to find a, a wide range of gear out there. All right. And next is the gear that I kind of have mentioned up here that is extra gear. And if you see on the far right, like the moon photograph I showed you earlier, I photographed that with a telescope. And so that's a lot of specialty gear, really expensive huge learning curve. But when you've been doing it as long as I have, you start wanting to explore more things and astronomy and stars have always been something that I've loved. And so that was a version of photograph or a, a, a road of photographing things that I really wanted to get into more. Uh, the other thing you're going to see here is I have something shown called a camera slider. And I'm going to show you an example of what that's for here in just a minute. The other thing is that I mentioned during the lightning photo that I used a remote to fire my camera. So that might be something that you also need. And if you're going to do stuff like portrait photography, like the modeling photo I showed you earlier of Rachel, you're going to need special flashes and they're kind of big and they're used to create artificial light and to light things in a certain way. And um, they're very useful though. So that's just some extra gear that you don't necessarily need to worry about having right now. You don't need a t telescope or anything to get started. It's just stuff that, you know, you build over time and these are things you can use, tools you can use to take more photographs. 
A moment ago, I showed you a camera slider, and you were probably curious what that's for, and that's useful for doing something called time-lapse photography. Now, time-lapse photography is the idea of basically kind of making a little movie, but making the movie in a condensed amount of time covering a long period of time. So here we're watching this nice sunset with the stormy clouds in the distance, the lake here that's going on, and the geese moving in and out of this photo. And the idea here is to capture a whole evening of what happened at this lake and condense it down into a short amount of time. So that's a time lapse. The camera slider here is useful because it's moving from left to right to move my camera to create another sense of motion. And the camera's panning from right to left very slowly also to create a sense of motion. You do not have to have a camera slider to shoot time lapse photographs, but it creates that sense of motion for you. You can set up on a tripod shoot a series of images, put them together to create a time lapse over time. All right, so we've talked a little bit about gear. We've talked a little bit about different types of photography. So let's talk a little bit about how to take a photograph. And really there's hundreds of rules that people could tell you and things that you're supposed to follow or whatever. Uh, but the, the two most important ones that I'm going to cover here today kind of really cover one principle, which is the idea is to take a photograph that is an interesting whole image and not just a picture of something. So if you take your phone or take a camera or whatever you got and you just take a picture of something, the question is how to make it more interesting, how to really fill out the whole image to make it what you want it to be. And sometimes you want it to be isolated, one little thing or whatever. That's cool. But a couple of rules here to follow when you go to take photographs and things you want to think about as you're setting up photographs, the first one we're going to cover is called the rule of thirds. Now, in the rule of thirds, the idea here is to make sure that you don't just focus on the middle of the image and go, yep, that's a mountain or whatever, and move on. I want people, as I lay in this rule of thirds, to go around my image and see the different parts of it. And so you'll see if you break this up into thirds that I kind of made the mountains the top third of the image. There's kind of the trees and a little bit of the flowers in the middle of the image as you move down. And the bottom part is kind of mostly the flowers. And then I use the right and left hand sides of this photo in those thirds to kind of frame in the middle part of the photograph and obviously the big Grand Teton in the middle. So here my goal is to create a total image that you want to move around, you want to enjoy the depth of, you want to enjoy the layers of, and really explore the whole image versus just taking a picture of a mountain or a flower. Next, we're going to talk about what's called the golden ratio. Now, the golden ratio really isn't something that you're going to like sit down and really think about too much. It's more just a thought process of going, creating movement and using lines and using things in an image to kind of move people around your image. And it's the same idea as the rule of thirds, which is that you want people to enjoy your whole image and not just one aspect of it. If I would have shot this photograph and just taken a picture of the interesting railing or just taken a picture of the, the ramp or just taken pictures of parts of it, it's not quite as interesting as the complete story of this where I kind of brought this out and I kind of made this swooping kind of like including the whole ramp and the people going down it, the little statue thing that's at the very bottom. You get the texture of the railings, the textures of the walls. So here you're just trying to make, as the line kind of outlines here, I want people to start and move around and really just enjoy the whole photograph. All right, so I gave you some rules. Now I'm going to give you a couple of reasons to break them. And really, this isn't, there's no consequences of these. It's just what you enjoy and what looks good to you. And once you start taking photographs, you really just go with your heart and what you want to convey to other people. And in this situation, I shot something directly in the middle of the frame that probably is the first thing you look at, which is the pillar here at the corner. But then I hope that you work outwards and you kind of choose your path. And the idea here is dark and light. The idea here is that the floor is different, some different geometric shapes, and that you kind of just want to see what's down these little paths or whatever. So that's the whole image to me. My goal here is that, again, you stay with this image. You don't just go, oh, it's a building. Oh, it's a whatever. I want you to really kind of take it in, kind of go, oh, well, that's interesting. The shadow's coming off those pillars on the sunrise on the right-hand side, or, ooh, the floor on the left side on the darker area, though, those nice geometric shapes they got going on on the floor. So... My goal is to have you really soak this in. And in this case, 
I don't want you to explore the whole image. In this case, I want you to move top to bottom in the image, and I kind of want to use the landscape around this waterfall to kind of draw you towards the middle on purpose, to kind of hug the waterfall in and have you kind of just cascade down the side of this mountain with the waterfall. And really, the waterfall is the focus here and what I want you to do. So, not necessarily the compositional rules of either of the rules I gave you, but a good reason to do it anyways, and I think it's a beautiful image. All right, so we've got some basics on some stuff, and so now we're gonna get a little bit more technical. And the first part of technical that I think is important to understand is how a camera works. Now, a camera is primarily two pieces. It's the camera itself, the, the sensor, the image, the thing that makes the picture, and then there's the lens on the front of said camera that controls things like how far or close you are from something and how much light and how much information gets to come through said lens to get to the camera itself. So here you're seeing on the left is a camera lens and you're looking through the inside of a camera lens at what's called the lens aperture. And the aperture is these blades that open and close to allow more or less light in to the camera sensor behind it. Now the camera sensor on the right is actually just the middle part, that little shiny thing you see in the middle of the camera is the actual sensor itself. And that's what's collecting the data. If this was a film camera, that would be where your film strip is lying over and it would be exposed to the light that the lens lets through when you hit the camera shutter and let that information all in. So that's where all the data is gathered and the camera around it controls the settings and controls um, the processes and allows you to work the rest of the system. So a little bit confusing, but just understand there's a camera and a lens, they work together, and how you control them and how you use them helps create your images. All right, so this is where we're gonna get kind of really technical. Now, it's not as horrible as it sounds. Like you're, you're looking at this and it's a lot of information to intake and really just understand that there's four main things to really focus on here. And one of them's a constant. And the other three things are just kind of the things you really need to worry about. So the constant here is that there's three settings on your camera to control you taking a picture. And that's called aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Now, the main function for those things is it controls how dark or light an image is. So if you change aperture one way or the other, your image can get darker or lighter. Same thing with shutter speed, same thing with ISO. Now, that's the primary function of all three settings. The important thing to remember about when you change these settings is that your triangle always has to be balanced. So if you turn your ISO way down and make the image darker, you're going to have to change your aperture or your shutter speed to make up for that to balance the image so that it's not too dark in the camera. Now, I know it's a little complicated. So just understand that dark and light is the primary function for all of these things. Now the secondary functions are the ones that you kind of have to learn what they do and how they work. And so I'm gonna show you some examples of that now, and hopefully it'll make sense to you. Always, you can come back and reference this, and the best thing I tend to tell people to do is take your camera out, start fiddling with the dials and taking some pictures and look at it yourself and go, oh, okay, I see how that works. So this is a picture of Mr. Superman that I took in my basement, and this is our example of aperture. As we mentioned with all the settings, the primary thing would be that whether I change the aperture one way or the other, it's going to get darker or lighter. Now, aperture in your settings is represented as what's called f-stops. And so the aperture setting on the far left image is f2.8, then it goes to f11 in the middle image, and f22 on the right. Now, like I said, balance your triangle, right? I change one, I need to change something else. Now, you can change all three to get your balance. In this case, to keep it as simple as possible, I only change the exposure time along with the aperture. So... For every time I made the aperture different, f2.8 means that the aperture, that opening in those blades is as open as it can possibly be in my camera lens. At f22, it's very small hole opening in the camera lens and it's letting through very little light, which is why the camera exposure time goes from one second to 15 seconds to 30 seconds. So light primary function. Our secondary function in this case is what's called depth of field. And essentially, that means that your plane of focus, how much of your area is going to be in focus, changes by how much aperture you have available to you. Now, this can sound complicated, but it's really not. If you place multiple objects in front of each other, in this case, it's Superman in front of a TV that's behind him with an image on it, and you make that aperture 
really wide open, that F2.8, you're going to have a very small amount of space on Superman that's in focus. And you can even tell by looking at him that his face is in focus, but even his hand right on his right-hand side is not in focus. So that plane, that, that depth of field is very narrow when you're shooting at F2.8. As you kind of close down that hole in the lens and you make that aperture bigger in number, but actually smaller in size, you increase your depth of field. And more of the things in the background in the TV, you see his hands start being more in focus, his S and everything on his chest are more in focus, the stars on the TV in the background start becoming more defined, you start seeing a little bit of features of the sun and what's going on on the planet behind him. If we move all the way to the right at F22, you really see, especially on his cape and things like that, or on his uh, boots, or he, the stars become much more defined. You can start seeing texture on the surface of the planet, and you can really kind of start defining the sun rays that are coming off of the star behind that. So, yes, it's a lot of information. It's complicated, but again, I'm going to make it very simple. The finalized thing is primary function, dark and light. Secondary function, how deep your depth of field is. That's all you need to know about aperture. Next, we're going to talk about ISO. And this is essentially a setting that makes, nowadays it would be kind of saying how sensitive your computer is to receiving information from the camera. So once you click your camera to take a picture and you have it all set up or whatever, the computer can be changed on how sensitive it is to taking that information. Now in film days, this had to do with how sensitive the film was. It was a chemical setting in the film to choose how sensitive it was to changing and having whatever is exposed to it put onto the film. So nowadays this is defined mostly in just digital, how sensitive the computer is. So the all three images here, if you notice, I made them all F11. So the background, the details, everything like that, your your field of uh, your depth of field in this situation is going to be the same on all three photographs. So we're not messing with that setting. What we're changing here is the ISO to make it higher, to make the camera more sensitive to the light that's coming into it. And as we make it higher, more sensitive to that light that's coming into it, we have to balance our triangle by making the amount of time the camera's taking the picture faster. And so in the first image, when our ISO is very low, I have the camera open for 13 seconds to balance my triangle. As I move my ISO up to 12,800, you see it comes all the way down to one eighth of a second. Now, these settings that I'm showing you move in smaller increments, but I'm making drastic changes for you to kind of show you the differences a lot. And then our last one's at 25,600 ISO, and it's only 1 20th of a second of time that the, the camera's actually open taking an image. Now, again, primary function here, dark and light, right? But the secondary function is a little bit harder to see on these images maybe as you look at them this far out. So I'm going to zoom in on them a little bit for you. And if you look on the right here, you can see kind of in, the, in between the stars and the sunny area, it's a little kind of muddier, muckier, kind of grainy looking. And if you look kind of on the left-hand side, you're going to see it's a lot smoother, a lot cleaner of an image. And that can even affect the details. If you look at Superman's eyes on the left versus Superman's eyes on the right, you can kind of see that there's a little bit of a difference in clarity and details in there. So the primary function of ISO, dark and light, how sensitive the camera is, and then the secondary function in this situation is grain or noise. Now, noise and grain can sometimes be used on purpose to create an effect in an image. Like if you're photographing something old, something rustic, and you kind of want that kind of grainy, gritty feel to it, people will purposely put their ISO up really high. So just something to think about. All right, our last setting on the cameras that we're gonna talk about is probably the most important one, which is your shutter speed. Now shutter speed's primary function, dark and light. How long is the camera open and accepting information? So you press the button on the top of the camera to take the photo. It opens the shutter on the camera to start receiving information for as long as you set that shutter speed for, and then it closes down and stops taking your image. Now. The primary function, dark and light. Secondary function is going to be motion. And so what I did here is have my wife wave her hand in the air. And I took a series of images at different shutter speeds to show you that the slower the shutter speed, the more motion that goes on in an image. 
And in this case, I left my ISO the same across all of them, and I just changed my aperture settings, which again, as we talked about, is depth of field, right? So as I'm moving my aperture from f22 down to f8 down to f2.8, you notice that the background becomes less defined, and I'm more isolating my subject. You'll notice this a lot in portrait photography, uh, when you see a pretty picture of somebody and it's like nice and blurry behind them and you really just kind of get that pretty picture of just the person without all the distracting elements in it, people are shooting a smaller depth of field to create that isolation. Now, in this case though, the important thing to understand is that as I move my shutter speed from 1 8th of a second to 1 60th of a second to 1 250th of a second, the faster that it goes, the slower amount of, less amount of time that my camera's open and accepting information, the less amount of movement you're going to get. And when you take pictures of things that are moving fast, like let's say birds that are flying around, or if you're taking pictures of sports or something that's really fast moving, you want your shutter speed to be faster. Like when I photograph birds, I shoot at one two thousandth of a second, usually uh, shutter speed. So yes, this all seems complicated, but your biggest thing to understand is that the three main settings, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO control dark and light. And then you just have to remember depth of field, noise, and movement. And if you can remember those things, then you're pretty set to take any photograph. Uh, here's just me setting up to take the photo of Superman, just for fun, just figured I'd show you guys how I did that. Now, here's my example of how I did it, how I balanced those settings to make this photograph of the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii. I put my settings down here in the bottom right. You can see I shot at f4, I shot at ISO 800, and I shot at 1 125th of a second. That the, that's how much time the, the camera was open to take information. Now, the reason I picked these things is that, as we mentioned, at f2.8, everything kind of gets blurry pretty much in the background, and I wanted to have a little bit more of the scene in focus that I could get. So I shot at f4 to kind of give myself a little more depth of field, to have a little bit more of the waves and the lava kind of texture and all that stuff not having that stuff be too blurry now i was shooting very early in the morning before sunrise and it was very dark out so i had to bump up my sensitivity in my camera a bit turn that iso up so that i could get a little more light exposure so i'm shooting iso 800 and i'm shooting at 1 125th of a second now if you've been paying attention you're kind of picking up on this quickly you would go well why wouldn't you just shoot a lower ISO so you get less of that noisy stuff and make your shutter speed longer. Well, in this case, I'm in a boat and we're actually in like six to eight foot waves and we're rocking around. And if I shoot the camera any slower than this, I'm going to start getting blur, some motion blur going on. I'm not going to have all the details in the lava as nicely. The water's going to start looking a little funky. So to be able to hold the camera in my hand and get a clean image that is in focus and all my details are there without motion blur. These were the settings I had to kind of, and as much a, as much in the depth of field that I could manage to get in, that's how I balanced my triangle to be able to get this image. So a lot of that comes with practice. You'll, you'll learn how to kind of find your settings for the, the photo you're trying to get. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about, and I just mentioned it a second ago, is there's one setting that's kind of just perpetual and it, it's not really something you have to memorize because it should just be something that is always going to be the case. And this happens whether you take a picture of your friend on your cell phone or anything else, You they need to be in focus, right? So you can fix a lot of things. What I'm going to I'm gonna teach you about something called post-processing or editing a photo afterwards. And to do that, you can make things, if they're a little too dark or a little too light or whatever, before you take the photograph, you can kind of fix those things afterwards a little bit with editing, but you cannot fix if something is out of focus. This image I took here, as you can see, if the stars weren't in focus when I took the image, I couldn't make the stars more in focus afterwards. I can change them if they're a little too dark or a little too light. Now, focus, when I mention it here is figuratively and literally, the figurative point is, is that this image took a lot of focus, a mindful focusing to actually take the image. This is actually three vertical photographs taken from right to left, and they were taken while I was communicating with my wife on the beach, and we're actually using lights. I have flashlights that we're using. So I'm leaving the camera open, and as the camera's open taking pictures of the stars, I'm taking a light and moving it across the scene on the ground in front of me, right in here in front of the camera, to expose these interesting uh, sediment formations that are going on and the uh, little bits of 
plant life and stuff like that, I want you to be able to see that. So I'm using a light to kind of create so you can see that. And at the same time I'm doing that, I'm communicating to my wife on the beach to do the same thing on the rocks out in the middle of the lake. So those are kind of lit up for you too. So you kind of get that reflection and that kind of interesting formation going on off in the distance that's also included in the photograph. So this took a lot of focus and setting up and you don't always have this amount of time to do this, but it's an interesting way to understand this. You know, sometimes it's worth it to sit down and plan out a shot and really kind of take that time versus just being in a situation like I was in the lava where we got taken out to where the the volcano was and I just had to go. I had to go on the fly. I had to change my settings. I had to choose my compositions and do all that stuff. And I had to just go off of experience and just get it how it was and hope that I got some good photographs. Where in this situation, I'm standing here, I've got a tripod set up, my wife and I got our plan and stuff out. So very different types of photography, both very fun and obviously you can get beautiful results with either one. So next, I'm going to give you a quote from a journalist named Malcolm Gladwell. I think it's an important quote. And he says, it takes 10,000 hours to truly master anything. Time spent leads to experience, and experience leads to proficiency. And the more proficient you are, the more valuable you'll be. Now, the important thing I want you to take from that is that you're never going to start off at doing anything in this world and just be amazing at it. Everything takes practice. Everything takes experience to get better at. And the more you do that, the more you're going to find it easier to do things like photographing in a boat at lava and feeling confident in your ability to do that. So in some of that experience has to do with just walking into a situation of like a sunrise and going, oh, this is how I'm going to frame this or being willing to kind of move and change your angles and mess with stuff. And so a lot of that has to do with experience. And that's how you kind of differentiate and create your own kind of style when it comes to photography. So experience, there's no other substitute for it. So we will move on. I mentioned shortly ago about post-processing and editing photographs. And this is just simply an example of a slice of this photograph here on the left versus a actually edited photograph on the right. Now, the reason I photograph this way or, or photographers photograph this way is kind of technical and it's hard to explain, but the photo you see on the left is what's called raw. And a raw photo is essentially just the raw data of what my computer, what my camera took in, right? So I clicked my shutter, it took the picture, and while it took in all the ones and zeros and the information that made up that image, it didn't mess with any of them. It just left them alone and put them there in an image. And then I take that image and edit it afterwards. And the goal here is that I get to make the image look like it was while I was there, what it was that I was my goal of, for what you to see. Now, this can sometimes be very creative process for people. I'll show you some examples of that later on. But the, the idea here is that you can kind of adjust the image afterwards. And by shooting it raw, it gives me more leeway to be able to control those things. So we'll talk about the stuff I use to edit photos. I'm going to kind of make this one quick. I use the Adobe suite of software, mostly for editing. I use Bridge for organizing my photos, Lightroom for doing batch photo editing. And I use Photoshop for editing most of my single photos or my big photos. Uh, Gigapan is used for merging photographs together, like the Starry Arch photo I showed you a minute ago. That one was merged together. And then there's some free options here on the right. Now, I can't actually speak to any of these free options. I have not used them personally. I can tell you that Adobe makes good products, so I'm guessing Adobe Express is probably a pretty good piece of software. The other two I have not used, but they came pretty highly recommended recommended from what I was seeing online. So it gives you an option to get into photo editing a little bit without having to spend any money on it. You can just go download them and try them out. So now that we've learned a bit about taking photographs, a little about composing them, a little bit of the technical stuff, uh, what types of photographs there are, you take this up as a hobby, you go buy your camera, you get into it and you decide, man, I really love this. I want more gear. I want to do this more often. I want to kind of turn it into a career or even a side career. How do I do that and make money? So the first answer to that question is clients. And if you're a portrait photographer, these clients would be families. You photograph for families or sports teams. And 
clients to me are people who want to hang my work in their home. They're the your parents or your, you decide you love my work so much that you want to go to my website and order something or whatever, you then become my client. And that's kind of my favorite way to make a living because I love the idea that people want my work so badly that they would pay it for it and put it up in their homes and have it there and look at it every single day. Now, my second note here is what's called commercial photography. And that's kind of what you see going on on the right-hand side of this screen. And commercial photography is... In this case, it's a medical office. It's a business. And they wanted my photograph to use in a common space where people would come in every day. And they wanted to kind of spruce it up a bit. And this is really useful. I do it in cafeterias, at schools, and hospitals, and hallways. And it makes it where when you're walking through a building or going through a place, that it's a much more interesting place to visit versus just bare walls. Or, yeah. So the idea is to just kind of make it look prettier, make people enjoy being in those places a little bit more. So the next thing I talk about is online making money. And this can be a lot of different ways. Uh, selling digital photographs, selling prints online. You can make money online by having an online presence, by promoting certain things or doing social media things, YouTube, things like that can make money online. It's uh, not as much, I'm not very good at that part of the world, I guess you'd say so much, but it is important. The last thing I mentioned here is brick and mortar, and that's essentially having an actual store that people can come to. Now, as a landscape photographer, that would be in the form more of a gallery, which would be where I would hang some of these pretty photographs, and people could come in and see them and go, ooh, I want to take that one home, and then they would take it home and hang it in their house or wherever they'd want to. Uh, for Portrait photographers, this would more take the way of being what's called a studio, somewhere where your clients and people could come inside of to have their pictures taken. Let's say you need a passport photo. Let's say you need headshots for something. <laughs> so that would be what a studio would be useful for for a portrait photographer. The one thing I didn't mention on here that I'm thinking about now as I'm doing this is there is something called a staff photographer that you can use where you basically get paid a salary and you work for publications, a magazine, something like National Geographic, or you work for CNN or Fox or NBC or somebody. And your job is to go take photos of news stories or sporting events or pretty much anything that you can think of. And those are what's called staff photographers. I have, uh, done that when I was much younger. I worked at a newspaper as a staff photographer for a while and I liked it. It wasn't, there was nothing bad with it, but I didn't get to find it as creative to me as I do other forms of photography. So it didn't really stick as something that I did for a long time. All right. I mentioned here about having your online presence be important though. So even if you're not very good, like I'm not very good at being an online selling photography stuff, I do need a home in this world to send people to, right? So you need a website. And you can do this by sending people to your social media if you want to, but it is much more professional looking and you can make much higher quality versions of your photographs on a website versus on something like Facebook or Instagram where they can press down your images a lot and people can't really view them in their, in their full greatness that they can if they're on your website. Now, the things I mentioned here are a couple of companies that are out there called Smug Mug, Squarespace. You can also use something like Wix. And these are what's called content management websites, which means that you don't have to know all the technical know-how to make a website. You essentially go there, you sign up, and they give you a template, and it's kind of plug and play. You just kind of drag and drop your photos where you want them. You just type in the titles and your names and your email addresses, all that kind of stuff. And it basically pops out a pretty website for you. And it's pretty easy to do or if you even if you struggle a little bit with that you can always go on YouTube and all these types of sites have YouTube guides and things like that that you can use that'll explain to you how to create those websites on those places but you can do it with almost no technical knowledge whatsoever now I do mention about using social media obviously spreading your name is very important I am terrible at this <laughs> if you go to my social media accounts they're probably not very pretty and they're not very well updated and I'm not great at it but it is that age it is the Instagram world so you should use it, and it is a very good way to ex get your exposure out there, get your images out there in front of more people, and dedicating your time to that is never a bad thing. The last thing I mentioned on this slide is about what's called contest websites. So you take a lot of photographs. What's kind of fun sometimes is 
seeing what other people think about them. Sometimes this is good for getting critical feedback about whether or not your images are working with people, not working with people. And it's kind of a fun way to give you some ideas too. So I mentioned the one I use is ViewBug. There's one mentioned here called Photo Crowd, and I know there's many of them out there. I just can only vouch for ViewBug because it's the only one I've used. And essentially, they give you a theme. They have different contests that say, you know, we want you to take pictures of something that's orange. We want you to take pictures of something technical. We want car photographs. And it kind of gives you different assignments to go out and photograph and to do and kind of can push you in some different directions and see if you enjoy something that maybe you haven't tried before. Or let's just say you're in a rut and you just haven't taken any pictures lately and you're just like, man, I don't know. I don't know what I really want to feel like photographing today. Sometimes it'll be like, well, go photograph this. And it's also a good sense of inspiration because while you're on these sites competing with these things, you get to see a lot of other photography work by a lot of very talented photographers. It can really kind of push you and teach you different styles, maybe a different, uh, you see a different type of photograph, uh, let's say something like HDR photography, which is, I won't go into the details about what that is, but maybe you run into something like that or black and white photography and you're just like, man, those really hit home with me. I really want to focus more on that. So it can be a really good sense of inspiration for you. All right, so now we've gotten here, we're going to talk about kind of what defines you as a photographer, right? So art is a very popular thing. Like a lot of people like doing art, want to do art, want to make a living off of it. And so there's stiff competition out there between you and other people who want to also sell photographs. So it's a good idea to kind of find something that sets you apart from other photographers. You don't necessarily make you better than other photographers, but kind of gives you your own voice or your own kind of style that makes people kind of want to come back to you. So having a client who goes, man, I love Ben's viewfinder's work. I love the way he photographs, the way he uses his colors, the way he frames his stuff up. I want to decorate my house with their stuff. Or the next time I open my next business or whatever, I want his stuff hanging on my wall. And so that's the goal. So what I do to differentiate my photographs is what I'm going to show you here. So in this image, I if you just look at it for just a moment and just kind of look at it and go, how many arches are in the photograph? You would usually just say one. I only see one arch in this photograph. But there are actually two. And if you're kind of curious, you're like, oh, okay. That is where the second arch is in this photograph. And maybe you were really keen to eye and you picked that up right away. But most of the time, you would kind of overlook that. And these really tiny details aren't normally photographed. And the reason that they're photographed in this situation is that this is not actually one photograph you're looking at. The big image of this whole scene that you're looking at is actually 27 images. And I stitched them together afterwards to make the one image that you see here. Now, everything that's in these images is always there. I don't ever add or take anything away from these photographs. They're always what was naturally there. But by breaking this up into 27 different images, I get a lot more detail and a lot more information to work with afterwards to be able to give to you. Now, if you were to take the same scene with just one camera or one shot of this scene on a cell phone or on a whatever, and you were to try to zoom in to see this little arch on the horizon, it would just be a mush of pixels. You wouldn't actually see that there. And so the more photographs you take, the higher resolution you take, the more details you have, and it allows you to actually blow these images up, make them a lot larger, print them a lot larger. I was telling you about putting them in common spaces like a cafeteria or something like that. This isn't the same thing as hanging a, a photo on your fridge. It's they're big and you need these fine details to be able to print that large. So here's an example of that, which is this is the photo I showed you earlier of Yosemite Valley, but it's printed eight feet wide and six feet tall. And I can print it this large and you can walk right up to the trees that are in the foreground there. And you can see all the details in the pine trees or all the textures in those rocks when you're standing right in front of this. But again, if you were to shoot this with a cell phone and try to print it eight feet by six feet wide, you would not have all these fine details that are still held and still shown in this image. All right, so that's kind of what differentiates me. And I believe the Yosemite Valley photo was eight images put together. And I think the most images I've ever done and put together was mm, 132, I think, somewhere in that range. That was the Grand Tetons. And it's a very large photograph. All right, so we're going to kind of move towards the end of this thing. And I'm going to stop lecturing you so much about details and stuff. And we're just going to kind of show you some photos. I'll kind of show you why I took some of these photos and 
kind of compositional stuff in here. The composition becomes obvious for the mirrored effect that I got in the river. And you kind of got some movement from the mountains and the stuff being a little bit closer to me on the right and kind of moving away if you move to the left, kind of down the river. A little bit of the reflections of the rocks and things in the foreground. So there's a lot of layers here. I really enjoy this. This is also Yosemite National Park. Now here, this one's a little bit different, and I told you earlier about wanting to draw motion in certain situations, and this is one of those situations. So this is the Colosseum in Rome, and this is one of my number one things I ever wanted to photograph as a kid, and I was very glad I got to do so. But when I got here and I was taking photographs of it, I really enjoyed that in the foreground of this image that there were these cars going by, and I wanted to kind of show this juxtaposition of modern day versus this ancient Rome back well before there were ever cars on the road. So to kind of create a sense of movement and kind of move you around the photo a little bit, I put my camera on a tripod. I took a longer exposure, a longer shutter speed and left my camera open to take in data longer. And it, so you get the blur of these car lights going by in the foreground on a modern road. And then you have the beautiful lit up Coliseum in the background of ancient times. So just kind of fun old versus new. Here I'm using the leading lines, kind of more of that golden ratio type idea of moving you around this image and kind of having you start in the bottom left, maybe in the foreground here and looking at the beautiful texture in the sand. And as you kind of move away, you got the shadows kind of moving in and out of the insides of these sand dunes up to the brighter areas, up to the right, and kind of working your way around and just enjoying the clouds. And hopefully you stay and if I would have just taken a picture of a sand dune or taken a picture of just the sky, you know, hopefully in this situation, because of the lines and the shadows and the textures and the plants down to the left and the interesting sky, that you want to stick around and look at this photograph longer. So that's the goal here. Here's a little bit different type of photography. I don't do this one a whole lot, but it's kind of like... Um, collecting something like if you collect comic books or something i like to collect skyline photos that i do and they're great they sell to as as souvenirs for people who've been to chicago or been to new york in this in this case and these are multi shots that have stitched together and the goal here or what's kind of cool about this is that if you were to zoom in on something like the verizon above the bridge there in the new york photo or if you were to zoom in on some of the buildings in Chicago, you can read the stuff that's on the sides of those buildings and go, oh, what's what's that building for? Where if you were to just take like a cell phone image of this, again, you wouldn't have those details. And again, I can print these pretty large. But I love doing some skylines every now and then when I get the chance. Next, this photograph isn't so much, I mean, it's a beautiful photograph. I love it, the mirrored, and I love the details in the eyes of the caiman. And uh, I'm a big fan of reptiles anyways and amphibians, so... I just enjoyed that factor of it. But this was taken at a zoo, and the biggest reason I included this photo to show you guys is that this was a case where I wasn't going to take the photograph. I had the idea for the photograph and was considering it, but the enclosure that the caiman was in was very, like, scratched up. The plexiglass was scratched up, and it just, I, it just seemed like it was going to be tough to try to get a clean image through it. And so I was kind of tossing the idea around in front of my wife, and I wasn't going to take the image. I was trying, like, ah, just forget it. And she convinced me. She like, just take the photo. She's like, try it out. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's fine. Delete the image. Don't use it. But at least you tried, right? So I did. I got a beautiful photograph. I love this photograph. And it's a good kind of example of just saying, just take the shot and try it out. Here's a couple more examples of just pretty scenes. I mean, there's nothing, but they kind of mentioned a couple of things I mentioned earlier about, you know, the stars and reflections and beautiful snowy mountains that was taken in Colorado. And on the right, I was talking earlier about capturing moments with animals and the emotions and that kind of stuff is what is important to me and what I really try to focus on. And I just loved the way that this mom and this young monkey were kind of cuddling. And I got the moment where the monkey happened to look right at my camera lens. And so I don't know, something just about this. And I liked it in black and white. And there's a little bit of shadows from the sunlight filtering through some trees above them. And just kind of a cool photograph. So I had also talked about motion and using creating motion images that works really well in waterfalls obviously and the reason i included this photograph so much in this presentation is to show you what is called filters so there are limitations to those camera settings i told you about your camera can only go so fast it can only go so slow it can only change the iso to certain ranges and in you sometimes run into situations like i took this during the middle of a very bright sunny day with very few clouds in the sky 
and I couldn't get my camera to stay open long enough to be able to take this motion of this water moving off this waterfall like this. I didn't, I couldn't make it this nice movement involved. So I used something called a filter that I put over the front of the camera lens, which basically was like wearing sunglasses for my camera. And that allows me to then put the camera back into a range where I can control the settings to make them how I want to, to create this motion. So I won't get too technical into that, but just to understand that there's kind of ways to manipulate the camera a little bit uh, to get to where you want to sometimes, even if it's outside the camera's natural boundaries. And then a fun kind of last picture here to show you is one that is called light painting. And this is a case where I have a camera set up on a tripod. It's up on this dock and I leave this camera open for minutes. Like I'd not, I don't remember exactly off the top of my head. It was three, four minutes maybe. And then you can really see that if you look up at the stars and that's actually the planet rotating. And that's why you see the stars kind of like as little streaks up there. And you can really tell that the clouds have been moving across the area and you can see the wind kind of going through the trees in the background. That's why the trees are a little bit fuzzy. So I have this camera open this whole time taking a very long image. And the whole time I'm doing that, I'm walking around on the beach with a flashlight and I'm light painting with a flashlight kind of towards the camera a little bit and writing out my wife and my name on the beach here. So everything you see here was taken in real life. We didn't add this in afterwards. It's not an editing trick. It's not anything. This is just the photograph I happen to take there. And due to me moving during this long period of time, and you'll get this and it's a little bit technical, I guess you'd say, but... If you were to take a four minute photograph with a person standing still on this beach, they would be standing there on the beach in this photograph after the fact. But the longer the camera is exposed and open and something is moving, the more it starts to kind of disappear because then the texture of the ground, in this case below the letters, is what the camera's getting more information from. That's soaking through for four whole minutes while me moving around is only in those little areas for 10 seconds here, 10 seconds here, while I write out the names. So just kind of a fun, again, there's always things to play with, always different things to do and try out in photography, and, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. So this is going to be where we're going to have a Q&A session. Now, if you're in person, feel free to ask your questions here. If you are online and watching this after the fact, there is all the... There is a comment section below, and I would love for you to ask any questions that you have, and I will do my best to get back to you and answer them. And the last thing I want to do is just say thanks for having me. And here's some information for me about my website, about my email, if you have any questions there. And just really glad that you guys had me out. I'm glad that I got to share a little bit about my passion and what I do with you. And hopefully you found some of it fun. Hopefully you just, you know, if nothing else, enjoyed the pretty pictures. And hopefully you pick something up and hopefully you go get a camera and hopefully you are bothering me for more questions about this later on. So thank you and thanks for tuning in if you're online.